So if we look at the research, if we look at all the data that's coming out, we know that BMI is not a very good standard of health. Waist circumference is a much better standard because waist circumference looks at where your actual fat lies in the body. So the liver is the only organ that regenerates, which is like the coolest thing ever, right? Like there's no other organ that regenerates. Leading dietitian and author Kristen Kirkpatrick. But we also know that your metabolic numbers, so metabolic numbers would be anything related to metabolic syndrome. So high blood pressure, low HDL, high triglycerides, high hemoglobin A1C, your glucose is too high. That is really a better indicator because it's giving you that sign that something is going wrong in the body. There's over 300 functions that the liver does to keep us healthy and well. And one of the things I tell my patients is like, we never think about our liver until something goes wrong and then it's the only thing we can think about. Within the liver, you have a normal amount of fat, about five to 10%, and that's normal. So once you get over that 10%, then you would be diagnosed with having fatty liver. The loved one would donate part of the liver to that individual. And within just about three weeks, both livers are back to normal size. It was crazy. It's just crazy how that happens. One in four individuals that you pass is gonna have a fatty liver. They may or may not know that. But the good news from the regeneration side is that. Hey there, friends. Welcome to the Happy Habit Podcast. I'm Matthew. I like to talk health, wellness, and self-improvement every Monday and Thursday with many of the world's leading experts. So if that is your kind of thing, you are in the right place. And if you're already familiar with some of the almost 400 episodes in the Happy Habit Archive at this stage, well then show your support. You can do it for absolutely free. You can like, subscribe on whatever platform you're enjoying this content. You can also share with other people who you think might get value from these episodes. And do leave the podcast a positive rating, which I know you can do on iTunes and on Spotify. I think we're almost up to five out of five at this stage. Also on Spotify, if you have the premium version of Spotify, you can enjoy the videos of these podcasts, which I know you can already do for free over on YouTube if you'd like to become a subscriber over there as well. Now, I'm joined today by renowned dietitian Kristen Kirkpatrick, who has co-authored a terrific book called Regenerative Health, Discover Your Metabolic Type and Renew Your Liver for Life. Now, the liver is a hugely important bodily organ, and in this episode, we find out why that is the case and what its role is in some of the 300 bodily processes it's responsible for shaping either directly or indirectly. Expect to learn about the four metabolic types and why metabolic type has replaced BMI, or the body mass index, as a measure of health. We explore what fatty liver is, discover why menopausal women make up a large proportion of Kristen's patients, does Kristen encourage the consumption of coconut oil, and we find out why a colourful diet should be embraced. We ask if it really is possible to detoxify the liver at all through a liver cleanse. We also talk about the new generation of weight loss drugs that are in the headlines at the moment, like Ozempic, and lots more besides. This is a really informative conversation, and I guarantee you will learn lots just as I did. I hope you enjoy. The subtitle of your book refers to metabolic types, of which you detail four in the book. This may be a new concept for people, and it has, in part, I think, contributed to a new way of thinking about metabolism and body type, which leaves behind the traditional metric that most people would have heard of. They'll be familiar with the body mass index or the BMI. Why is it that the BMI is a poor metric now as far as metabolism is concerned? And then could you outline what the four metabolic types are mentioned in the book? Um, so thank you for having me on, on your show, too. I'm so excited and honored to be part of part of this and all the great work that you're doing for everyone around the globe. So, you know, as a, I've been a dietitian for over 20 years, and I feel like for the first 19 and a half years of my career, Someone would come in, we would look at their BMI, and we would assess them based on that number. So we would look at that BMI and say, okay, this person is not really healthy, so we're going to help that person get towards health. So if we look at the research, if we look at all the data that's coming out, we know that BMI is not a very good standard of health. 
Um, waist circumference is a much better standard because waist circumference looks at where your actual fat lies in the body. You know, if your fat lies in the midsection, if you've got a lot of, um, you know, visceral and subcutaneous fat, we know that's close to organs, that's active. There's a lot of downside to it. But we also know that your metabolic numbers, so metabolic numbers would be anything related to metabolic syndrome. So high blood pressure, low HDL, high triglycerides, high hemoglobin A1C, your glucose is too high. That is really a better indicator because it's giving you that sign that something is going wrong in the body. So that's really why we said, okay, we're not going to focus on BMI. And people are given this BMI number. It doesn't really mean much. But what we're going to focus on is waist circumference. And then what are the numbers that you have and are they abnormal? And that's essentially how we broke down the metabolic types. So the four metabolic types is number one. Um, and we're talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, but someone who uh, has a normal waist, normal metabolic numbers, maybe they have some genetics that make them predisposed to fatty liver. So they're going to be the first type. Um, the second is going to be someone who has a normal waist, but they're abnormal in terms of their metabolic numbers. Third would be um, their metabolic numbers are normal, but their waist is too high. And then the fourth is everything comes together. Waist is too high. Metabolic numbers are abnormal. So we really believed, um, Dr. Ibrahim and I, that when we came up with these types, the more aggressive the recommendation, the more aggressive your type would be. So if you have high waist circumference and your insulin resistance or and your triglycerides are high, you might need a little bit of an aggressor, aggressive approach to reverse the condition. When we talk about fatty liver disease, are we talking specifically about visceral fat? I, I spoke with a doctor a couple of weeks ago who was speaking about visceral fat, uh, fatty organs all over the body and the inflammation that came with that and the dangers that came with it from a metabolic standpoint. Um, well, we're talking actually about both types of fat. I mean, we're talking about visceral fat, subcutaneous fat. And I think the key here is that we're really honing in on fat in the liver. Within the liver, you have a normal amount of fat, about 5 to 10%, and that's normal. So once you get over that 10%, then you would be diagnosed with having fatty liver. So we are talking about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. There is definitely this stigma where you have a patient who says like, well, what's wrong? My liver is like screwed up. What do you mean? I don't drink. Like, how could that, how could that happen? Um, so we're talking, of course, you can get fatty liver from drinking too much too. But what we're looking at here is really kind of the metabolic storm. If you're insulin resistant, if you have a type 2 diabetes, you are much more prone to development of this condition. Just to contextualize this for people, what exactly does the liver do? Oh, how much time do you <laughs> <laughs> You can give me the lady, the ladybird version, the bullet point. Right, I'll give you the clip notes. <laughs> um, so the liver is involved in every single solitary metabolic moment that we have in the body. So it's involved in blood sugar regulation when it senses that blood sugar is too low. It works towards releasing blood sugar to, re to make that a homeostasis type. Um, so that's number one, blood sugar management. It also helps with blood clotting. We know every, most people know this, that liver helps with detoxification. So we experience toxins within our food. We experience it when we go out for a walk. So something needs to detoxify. Something needs to take those and say, okay, that's not good. Let's convert it and get it out of the body. So the liver takes takes care of that. Um, the liver is is really involved in every single every single function that the body has. There's over 300 functions that the liver does to keep us healthy and well. And one of the things I tell my patients is like, we never think about our liver until something goes wrong and then it's the only thing we can think about. So we think about our heart, we think about our brain. Those are really important organs to, to focus on, obviously. But if your liver's not working, none of those other organs will work as well. And so that's really the connection that I, that I bring is that it's so important. It kind of like just hangs back and doesn't take any of the limelight that the other organs do. Um, and it takes a beating, but if, if it starts going wrong, all organs will start failing. I believe most of your patients are menopausal women. Is there something about this particular cohort of society that are more inclined to have issues in relation to this? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, when you get into perimenopause, when you get into postmenopause and you lose estrogen, you are more prone to building belly fat. 
So there's 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 so much that like is not good for a woman once we start losing our estrogen. Um, we're more at risk for heart disease, much more at risk for heart disease. We're more at risk for having high cholesterol, for having abnormal lipids. So some of those things that I talked about in metabolic syndrome, we're much more at risk for that once we get to that. And then, of course, the belly fat. So postmenopausal women have a separate risk factor. And, you know, what's really interesting when we looked at our patients is that I've had patients that started with me in their 30s and they've been really struggling, really trying to either lose weight, improve their numbers, um, yo-yo dieters, things like that. And so they've had time. It takes time for this condition to get from benign to really serious to you need a liver transplant. That takes time. So what's happened, what I've seen in my practice is that these women come in, they're struggling for 10, 15 years. They already have fatty liver and then they go into menopause. And then it just kind of like, it kind of skyrockets from there because they have all these other risk factors going on. So I, I always say that menopause is not um, a death sentence by any means in terms of health for women, but we do have to focus on other things once we get to that stage in our life to make sure we can stay as healthy as humanly possible. At the heart of this book is the subject of re regeneration and renewal and restoration. So how can people go about renewing uh, their health, uh, but more specifically their liver in this context? Yeah. So the liver is the only organ that regenerates, which is like the coolest thing ever, right? Like there's no other organ that regenerates. And I was so lucky to to have the experience of of doing this book with Dr. Hannah Ney, who's like this world-renowned hepatologist. And he would share case studies with me where you would have two individuals, someone who needs a liver and a loved one. The loved one would donate part of the liver to that individual. And within just about three weeks, both livers are back to normal size. It was crazy. It's just crazy how that happens. Um, basically how we came up with, with the title of regenerative because the liver does regenerate. But we're also looking at it from a health perspective. The good news about this condition, even though one in four individuals have it, so you walk out to the, to, to you go to the mall today, one in four individuals that you pass is going to have a fatty liver. They may or may not know that. But the good news from the regeneration side is that you can totally reverse it. So the, as I said earlier, your liver can take a beating. It can get knocked down over and over and over again until it finally says, I'm done. So before you get to that I'm done approach, you can reverse the condition. And some of the ways to do that is really to look at lifestyle. Um, this Again, this isn't about alcohol, but reducing alcohol will definitely help because um, the liver is completely responsible for detoxifying when we have alcohol come into the system. But really looking at you know where are my carbohydrates coming from? Am I eating a lot of ultra processed foods? Am I eating things that are not tied to fiber? So anything that I always say, like I, I use sometimes non-medical terms, and I say that anything that makes your blood sugar and your insulin go nuts is going to be very bad for the liver. So that's kind of one way to think about that. I spoke with a Professor Robert Lustig a few months ago who has been a proponent of cutting out fructose, high fructose corn syrup and ultra processed foods from people's diets. And he said that uh, consuming a, a lot of sugary foods is tantamount to drinking a lot of alcohol because their basis is the same. Yes, absolutely. So what happens is that the liver becomes really overwhelmed. It is involved in that blood sugar management, the storage. Um, so when we have insulin resistance or the body's simply not sensitive enough, what happens is the body keeps pumping out more insulin to compensate for the mismanagement of the blood sugar. That then impacts the liver and the liver starts storing that blood sugar as fat. So that's how kind of the fat formation occurs. And it really doesn't matter if you're having a sugary drink or you're having a, you know, a pretzel that could be ultra processed. Um, the, the, the thing that happens is the same. And that's why I said that it's really tied to fiber. So one of the things I never want my patients to think is, oh, I can't have any fruits because fruit is so sugary. But fruit has a lot of antioxidants, phytonutrients, and it's got a ton of fiber. So we don't put fruit in that category. We're looking at things that have no capacity to slow down the absorption of blood sugar into the blood of blood sugar into the bloodstream, right? So when you have fiber, that slows down the process. And I often tell my patients, like, let, let's let's look at kind of two different buckets. We can look at a piece of licorice. 
you take a bite of it and your body's like, this is awesome. I love this. Like, I'm feeling great. You get this high and your blood sugar, your insulin are like a roller coaster that's really steep. And then you have a really steep drop, really steep drop. But when you have something that has fiber, so let's say like an apple, apple has soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. The body still senses the simple sugar. Oh gosh, we got this simple sugar. This is great. I love it. But then I got this fiber thing. I don't know how to break down fiber. Body just doesn't know how to do it. And so that slows it down. So now you don't have the roller coaster. You've got more of just kind of a roaring hill. And that's a huge difference for how much work the liver has to do to manage your blood sugar. I'm interested to hear your thoughts on this next question. Does the order of the food that you eat um, affect your blood sugar levels? In other words, if you're eating something that has on the plate that is high in sugar, but you also have beside it, let's say something that's a high in fiber like a cruciferous veg. If you eat the cruciferous veg before the sugar, will that spike your blood sugar uh, less than eating the sugary f- food before the cruciferous veg, if you understand my question. Yeah. No, I understand it totally. Um, so when I look at a, a scenario like that, I call it competition for digestion. So when you have a bunch of things coming in at once, so the cruciferous vegetable, or we could even we could even say you have a piece of chicken, so lean source of protein, you've got extra virgin olive oil, healthy fat. All of those things take a little bit more time, effort, and work for the body to break down and get through. So it's not as if the blood sugar management takes um, a back seat. It doesn't. It's still there. But you're probably going to see a little less aggressive standpoint in terms of, um, you know, the, the actual up and down from it. But if you just think high level, realistically, most people aren't enjoying a big bowl of broccoli with a cola, right? So it's like typically what we see, we see this in studies too, right? Like, so you see like, Okay, yes, they they were had this intervention, but they're following a Mediterranean intervention. So they're most likely also exercising. They might be doing meditation or stress management. Right. So we see certain lifestyle habits kind of go together. So uh, but your example is is accurate that it, it you wouldn't have as dramatic of an approach because you have other good things coming in at the same time. I'll tell you what prompted that question. I actually was following a guy on Instagram who had a blood a glucose monitor on, on his arm. Uh, which seems to be all the rage these days. And he, 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 he samples different foods every every single day. And he was just curious about the impact on his blood sugar levels of eating foods in different sequences. So that's the reason why I, I asked yourself that. Uh, so interesting. So what were the results? What did well, he find? Well, the, the result was, what well, certainly he found that, now this was in a, in a non-laboratory context, obviously. Right, right, he was doing this at right. But uh, no, he, he simply found that if he ate a high fiber food followed by a sugary food, uh, as you said, the the spike in blood sugar levels would be diminished compared to eating the sugary food right. prior to the, uh, to, to the cruciferous vegetable or whatever it was. Yeah. So I was just curious to, to get your, your yeah. thoughts on that. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're a big fan of eating a colorful plate. Could you talk to us about the value of doing this? Um, so I think the, the, the value of focusing on color is, like I could tell you, at least like in the United States, we have these dietary recommendations for Americans. Some are great, but they're meant for healthy individuals and not all are applicable. So what happens is I'll have patients come to me and they'll say, oh yeah, my doctor told me that I'm supposed to have seven to 11 servings of fruits and vegetables. And I don't know where I'm going to find that kind of time, right? So people automatically shut down. It's like seven to 11 throughout the one day. Are you crazy? But if we kind of unwrap it in a different perspective, it becomes much more doable and even easy. So instead of looking at the servings, which by the way, a serving is like a handful. So I think the other thing, like when we have a big apple or we have a bowl of berries, we're like, okay, that's one serving. Check that box. It's probably two and a half servings because it's more than a handful. But um, so when we look at that, I think it's much more easy to relate to color. So what I tell my patients is I want you to get a lot of different color because getting different colors, obviously from plants, not from a colored cereal, right? But getting different colors means you're getting different phytonutrients, different vitamins, different minerals, et cetera. Um, I've had patients that will come to see me and say, I'm good, Kristen, because like I have a kale salad every night. So I'm like, I I think I'm doing pretty good. Well, that's great. But what outside of the green are you getting? Is there any other color? No, no, no. I just love my kale. So we know that the more variety you have in the diet, 
the more your microbiome responds in a more positive manner. So microbial diversity is very much tied to dietary diversity. Even though kale is great, that's one color and that's one vegetable. So we need to expand and consider multiple different colors throughout the day. That gives us a variety of different plants. You have a whole chapter devoted in the book to feeding the liver. Does the microbiome interact with the liver and how, how does it interact with the liver and how is that then affected by the food that we eat? Yeah, it definitely does. I mean, if you think about it, if we kind of think about organs in, in terms of buckets, um, the liver is part of the GI system and it's also close to the GI system and it feeds into the GI system in terms of the portal vein and where the, the blood flow is, et cetera. So when we think about our microbiome, I always, I always tell my patients, like, think about your, your guts or your microbiome as like a battlefield, right? And you got two sides. You've got the good guys and you got the bad guys. And whoever has the most soldiers, whoever you arm with the most weapons is most likely going to win the war. So how do you arm them? You arm them with your dietary choices. So are you going to arm the bad guys? So that's sugar, you know, just really low nutrient, very standard American diet, Western diet, or are you going to arm the good guys? So when we think about the resiliency of what the liver is able to do, a lot of that is also given by the microbiome as well. If you have a strong microbiome, if you have good gut microbes, number one, it means your diet is probably full of fiber as well as fermented foods. So you're getting those good nutrients, which then translate back to the liver. Um, if you're feeding the wrong army, you're also increasing the incidence of fat within the liver at the same time. So there is a connection. Um, I, I, I wouldn't say there's a strongest connection with the microbiome as we have with the brain, right? So we're not calling the microbiome the second liver by any means, although we call it the second brain. Um, but there is a connection because of the proximity between the two. And because of how powerful the microbiome is on overall health, and we're learning about the guts uh, every day, every day we're learning more. A question that somebody asked me to ask you when they, they heard I was going to be talking to you today, is it possible to detoxify the liver? So I love that question. It seems so simple, like, oh, yes, of course, like we can detoxify the liver, but people often do it in the wrong way. So I get I get this question all the time. I will have someone email me and say, "Hey, can you can you look at the ingredients in this um, detoxification, you know, juice that I got or this pill that I got?" And you know, does everything look good to you? And I'm always like, "Why don't you take the money you spent on this liver cleanse and go buy some fruits and vegetables?" So what we don't have is we don't have clear science, or really, I would argue, any very strong science that shows that these liver cleanses that we buy do anything to the liver, like do absolutely anything. Um, but we do have a lot of science that what we choose to eat from a dietary perspective does. So I think we waste a lot of money by really kind of looking at to these liver cleanses where really if you just research some of the foods, if you have coffee, if you have extra virgin olive oil, if you have kiwi, um, if you have berries in your diet, if you have soluble fiber in your diet, this is much more detoxifying and you're going to get other nutrients alongside it. So I'm not a fan of liver cleanses at all because I'm very evidence-based. If you don't have some good studies backing it, I'm probably not going to promote it. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, it's about having real food. Right? We see this, of course, like in the blue zones, people that live the longest, that have the least amount of disabilities, they are not doing liver cleanses. Right. They're just not. They're not doing these liver cleanses. They are eating a very, very diet. They're doing natural movement. They're in communities. All of these things are so important. I am so pleased you said that. I am actually going to show this uh, this interview to my friend because I've been telling this friend of mine for a long time that uh, the, the best way to go is the natural way and to consume good foods if you want to detox anything. So thank you so much for, <laughs> for proving yeah, so me right. Well, I'll be very unpopular to your friend, but that's OK. <laughs> um, you, you have different food plans outlined in the book. There's the modified food plan, the moderate carb, the low carb food plan and family plans. I don't expect you to go through all of them, but is there a common theme across these food plans? Yeah, the common theme is really uh, we, the base of all of these plans are the Mediterranean diet. Uh, when we looked at all of the data, we spent over a year researching just to figure out, OK, what's the best data in terms of dietary patterns? Um, I think the common theme is that the Mediterranean diet 
prevails throughout every single section. Where we alter things is if you're someone who has the very high waist circumference, your metabolic health is very abnormal, then we might say, okay, let's let's cut the overall carbohydrates by about 10 to 15 to 20%. Um, and then really look at, okay, how can we do that, take that moment and help with uh, reducing insulin resistance? So that's really where the changes are. It's really important to us. And, you know, so, so when you write a book, it's like you can't be there explaining things. So it's just like it could be really challenging. But what we didn't want to do was fall into diet culture. We didn't want to really fall into restrictive behavior, fall into you have to deprive yourself. Um, what we wanted to do was give choice, but we also couldn't ignore the fact that low to moderate carbohydrate plants have been shown to be the best remedy for reversal of fatty liver disease. And those uh, food plans and recipes are all outlined in the book as well. And we touched upon it a couple of moments ago, but I, I'd like to revisit the subject of inflammation. It seems to be the case that the world is suffering from an epidemic of uh, systemic inflammation. Could you talk yeah. to us about, first of all, what it is, how, how it's characterized, what the symptoms are, and then what anti-inflammatory foods that we can take in order to offset or mitigate against systemic inflammation? Yeah. So I always like to describe inflammation as kind of like starting with the basics, right? You cut your finger, all the white blood cells go rushing to it. Um, it becomes red. Over time, though, it heals. So the body senses there's some sort of, um, you know, some, some sort of insult. It goes to heal it. And then over time, you know, patched up, your finger looks normal again. The difference is when you have chronic systemic information internally, the finger doesn't get patched. So it's unresolved. So unresolved inflammation is what leads to disease. And we know that most diseases are at their base, start with some sort of inflammatory factor. In terms of the symptoms, you know, symptoms can be really nondescriptive. It's like sometimes the symptom could be something as simple as I can't sleep well or I have brain fog. Um, so the symptoms don't always say, oh my gosh, I must have a lot of inflammation. In terms of testing, you know, C-reactive protein sedimentation rate, those are the best ways to test for overall inflammation. Um, but you know, it was really interesting. I was listening to uh, Deepak Chopra do an interview a few weeks ago, and someone was talking to him about, I think they were talking about COVID actually in pandemics. And he said that inflammation is actually the greatest pandemic of our time, which was a really interesting perspective to look at. And then he went into details about kind of inflammation. So um, it's really anything in the body that's unresolved. So something goes wrong and it's not healed. And so it continues to pester. So in terms of what are some anti-inflammatory foods, all plants have benefits to anti-inflammatory. Um, you know, a lot of times people will say, well, it's the best superfood. Well, there's probably like 50, right? So it just depends on what you actually enjoy, what's your preference, what you'll actually eat. Um, but I would say cruciferous vegetables are definitely up there. Um, we know they have the most evidence towards reduction of risk of cancers. I would say healthy fats like extra virgin olive oil, also very much up there. There's been a lot of new studies lately on flavonoids. So flavonoids are found in really deeply hued fruits and vegetables um, and green tea, uh, coffee, those types of things. We all know that those are things that can help overall reduce inflammation in the body. What are your thoughts on coconut oil? Coconut oil, um, you know, there's some there's some studies that look at coconut oil as being potentially beneficial to lipids. But then we have other studies showing that coconut oil, even though it might lower LDL, it can raise, I'm sorry, might lower LDL, it also lowers HDL in the process. And we want our HDL to be higher. So I like coconut oil, but I don't like it to make up 80% of the diet. So coconut oil, I kind of see as, you know, if you want to have a dish every once in a while that's going to have coconut cream, coconut oil, I think that's great. But if, again, if we just look at the data and we compare extra virgin olive oil or avocado oil with coconut oil, it is very clear which one has the most bioactive compounds for disease prevention. And that is not called coconut oil. So I think... Um, I, I would never say don't have it in the diet, but I, I also would never recommend it to be your number one oil of choice. 
Do you find that even in 2024, you still as a dietitian have to convince people uh, that fats are not all bad, that we have to have some good fats in our diet? Because we've been yeah. brainwashed, I think, into thinking down through the years yeah, that, totally. that fats are bad. And, 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 and I know this was done in part as, uh, by the, the sugar lobby back, I think, in the 60s or 70s. So could you talk to yeah. me about that? I love fats. I think fat is so wonderful. And not only do we know that fat has a lot of benefit in the diet, but it also fills us up. So it's just so interesting uh, when I have patients that are just like, oh, I'm always hungry. I'm always hungry. And yet they're reducing their fat. So it's like if you go back to the old thinking, and I remember this, I was guilty of it. I remember being in high school. And once there were all these fat free foods out, like the snack wells and all of those and I would be like, oh, my gosh, I can't have eggs in the morning anymore. I got to have like bagels. And so that's what I did. Right. And then what happened? I put on an enormous amount of weight, just eating a whole bunch of carbs, but never having fat. So fat is difficult for the body to break down from any form, whether we're talking about lard or we're talking about olive oil. It's hard for the body to break it down. So that keeps us fuller longer. So when we have fat added to a meal, we just stay more satisfied. We feel more full. Um, but we also know that fat plays a huge role in being able to reduce the risk of certain chronic conditions and can be very beneficial for heart disease. And in terms of like, do you still have to convince people of things? The heart component, I think, is the most difficult. Um, I, I always joke that my my father was a Cleveland Clinic cardiologist for like 48 years. And that was always our biggest argument. All right. He was always like, no, I'm telling everyone to drop their fat. And I'm like, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. <laughs> right. Um, so even in that perspective, if you, even if you have someone with severe heart disease, you, we ran clinics, pro, clinic programs, the Cleveland Clinic. We've done Ornish. We've done Esselstyn, where we see very impressive, amazing results when people do have a very low fat diet. But what I see with these patients is they end up back in my office a few years later saying, I just couldn't sustain it. So that's really but what it boils down to. What can you sustain long-term? And if a low-fat diet is not something you can sustain long-term, then it's not the right option for you. Do you have any preferred sources of protein for those people who, who do consume animal protein and those who don't, for example? Yeah, I mean, we recommend uh, wild fatty fish. We love fatty fish, so getting things that are high in omega-3s. Um, if you look at, let's say, the MIND diet and both the MIND diet and the DASH diet, poultry is another thing that's included as well. You know, for people that are like, I really love red meat, I don't want to give it up, then I think going with wild red meat, a buffalo or a venison, or even just like a grass-finished regular red meat is fine. But I would still say I wouldn't have those in the, the same amount of prevalence that I would fatty fish and poultry. But those would be my my favorite animal sources. I think there's a lot of benefit to whey protein. So we've seen that as well. Um, we started off talking about postmenopausal women. So a lack of muscle is really what kind of also can contribute to this increase of belly fat. So getting whey protein in after workouts, making sure you're getting enough of that type of protein can really help with muscle management. Interested to hear your thoughts on Ozempic. Does the advent of, of these uh, fat loss drugs, does it make your job easier or more difficult? So um, I think for the most part, they're really game changers. They are for sure. There's no doubt about that. Um, and it's not so much easy or difficult. But what I see is individuals who say, well, I'm on Ozempic, so now I do not need a dietitian anymore because this is taking care of everything. Well, I think what people fail to recognize is that if you get on Ozempic or any of these GLP-1 agonist drugs, so if you get on any of these and you're just eating small amounts and that's how you're losing weight, but you're not focusing on how much protein you should have, you're not focusing on any additional supplementation you should consider, like creatine, for example, has some benefits. What we see here is that if you get off the drug, you're going to pile on the weight because over time you become metabolically fatter. You start losing the muscle and you're thin, you're now skinny fat. So if you get off the drug, you lower the dose. I have seen this over and over again. You start piling back the pounds. So where I have seen success in individuals is they're focusing on protein. They're making sure protein is in every single meal. They're getting banged for their nutritional buck. 
So when they're focusing on that nutrient density, if they lower the dose, they they gain less weight than someone who never took any dietary consideration at all. So I think the the true power that dietitians have and the opportunity we have is working alongside these individuals who are on these GLP-1 agonist drugs, not saying, oh, you're on the drug, you don't need me anymore. Because there are some huge dietary ramifications that, that can help offset plateauing and weight gain. But I suppose in that context, then you still need somebody who is compliant that you're working with and you have a, a, almost a symbiotic relationship with your client because they have yeah. to they have to still be proactive about behavior change, even when they're on these drugs. Still have to. Yeah. And you still have to focus on other things like sleep and stress management and all of those things. So I think, um, you know, the real question is, and I'm, it hasn't been answered yet in science is when you get on these drugs, are you on them for life? Is this a lifelong commitment or are these drugs where you could go on and off based on some other indicators? Um, There was just a new article I read right before I got on today about, um, I think, approval of one of the drugs for like women or not, not just women. I think it was men and women, but approval for people that were overweight and had major cardiovascular risk. Um, And looking at the concept of like insurance coverage for those groups of people. So I think the other factor here is who is getting on these drugs. Um, I know people who needed to lose 10 pounds and they're getting on these drugs. They lose the 10 pounds and they're like, okay, I I did what I was supposed to do. They get off the drug and they put on 25 pounds. So or they lose so much weight that they barely have any energy to even stand anymore. Right. So I think we also have to look at the appropriateness of the patient. Are you someone who really is considered overweight or obese, do you have metabolic abnormalities? That's where the game changer is for some of these drugs. When we see experimentation with individuals that needed to lose 10 pounds, could be a little bit more challenging and problematic. How much of your role is involved in looking at somebody's relationship with food in the first place as far as it being unhealthy and they're eating for the wrong reasons, for example? Yeah, um, I think huge. I mean, I, I think that most individuals that struggle with changing dietary pattern. Um, They always benefit if they're working alongside me and a mental health professional. And that's not to say that there's anything wrong with them from a mental health perspective, Um, but it is very helpful when you see the kind of the relationship between mental health professional and dietitian together, because there's so many reasons why we choose to eat something. And many of the times it has nothing to do with hunger. So I think like getting to the point of how do you listen to your body? How do you Take the cues from your body that it's time to eat and that it's time to stop eating. That's a real challenging one. When is it time to stop eating? Um, You know, that's one perspective. I also think there has to be a perspective of like, I always tell my patients, like, everyone's got a non-negotiable. Most people, it's bacon. Some people could be a cookie. But everyone's got one. So I always ask my patients, what's your non-negotiable? And how do we keep that in? Because the second I tell you, you can never have bacon again. It's so bad for you. It's like, that's not going to happen. You might give it up for a few months. You'll go back to it. So I think we can't like beat ourselves up for the fact that on Sunday, we might go have donuts with our kids. Okay. That's once a week. So it's not the once a week type of thing that we do that impacts our longevity and our health span. It's when the once a week becomes every single day. So I think we need to give ourselves a break. Part of healing our relationship with food is allowing ourselves to not look at food as good or bad, but looking at food that either is going to help my health or neutral, or it's going to hurt it. And the amounts really can dictate that. So much common sense. An awful lot of it dispensed in the book as well. Let me give the title of the book is called Regenerative Health. Kristen, thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Thank, Thank you so much. It was a pleasure. Well, thank you for tuning into this episode of the Happy Habit Podcast. If you enjoyed it, or indeed any of the previous almost 400 episodes at this stage, please show your support, like, subscribe, share with other people you think might get value and enjoy this content too, and do leave the podcast a positive rating. Until next time, stay happy. Mm-hmm.